Welcome to the first of a series of webinars or seminars online that we'll be hosting with the International Society of Electrocardiology. This is the first of those, and I'll introduce you to Tom Ribeiro, our president, who will then get us into the speakers and uh, outline some of the goals for this seminar series. Uh, so it was a, a suggestion of Adrian uh, that we can run this uh, monthly webinars on uh, electrocardiology uh, and we have the big pleasure of having this first one with uh, Professor Baez de Luna and Adrian Barashuk uh, to discuss specifically the, the Baez syndrome. But before uh, giving them the voice and the possibility of presenting uh, their studies in, in this field, we would like to present the, the winner of the Bias ECG Award. Uh, the, the Bias ECG Award was uh, created in, in homage of Professor Antonio Bias de Luna, one of our masters of electrocardiography. And it, it's a single award to recognize young investigators with the best publication portfolio in electrocardiology. Uh, Professor Antonio, Antonio Bias de Luna, he is professor of cardiology at the University of Barcelona and a cardiologist at Hospital de São Paulo in Barcelona. He studied cardiology in the University of Barcelona in the Institute of Cardiology at the Henry Smith Hospital in London. Professor Baez de Luna was, was, has served as director of several institutions, the Catalan Institute of Cardiology, the Hospital de La Santa Cre in São Paulo in Barcelona, uh, also the president of the World Heart Federation, founder and the first president of the Catalan Society of Cardiology, the president of the Spanish Society of Cardiology and the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy. Uh, Professor Baez de Luna has authored uh, hundreds of articles in leading journals. It's a uh, uh, is, and has spoken in many international conferences and meetings around the world. But I, I really would like to stress something that was very important for me, that the ability and the intention of Professor Baez de Luna to, to teach electrocardiology for the young generation. So this first book was the book I used in my medical residency decades ago, uh, the, the red one. And uh, I, I read every line of this, this book and try to emphasize what is important and consider so many things important that it's really, really uh, scratched in several ways. But uh, Professor Baez de Luna published several books. books. I, I tried to, to get some of them here, but there are uh, dozens of, of them. And in this way, he participated in the formation, in the development of cardiology and, and medical doctors uh, all the world uh, around, and this is very, very important. For considering the importance of uh, studying uh, electrocardiology, ECG, and to, to have this very old activity uh, to, to become an activity of the younger generation, uh, it was an initiative of Adrian Baranchuk to, to create this, uh, this award. And I, I, I had the, the pleasure to, to lead uh, this uh, judgment uh, team with Professor Antonio Baez de Luna and Professor Bulent Goranek, who is the president-elect of our society. And it's unfortunately, he, he could not be uh, present here today, but will be in the next one because he will lead this, this next one, uh, the next webinar. And we have, so we have the big pleasure of uh, presenting our uh, our D for 2020, a few months later than with respect to, to to do this, and we are very pleased to have uh, Bryce Alexander as our uh, nominee or the person selected to uh, the the Bryce ECG Award 2020. Uh, I, I know that Bryce is uh, with us, and maybe. If he, if he wants, he can say only a few words for us. Uh, great. Well, thank you. I'm very honored to receive this award. Um, we've done a fair amount of research in entry-drill blocks, so receiving an award named after the founder <laughs> is uh, 
it's a big honor for me. I'd also like to thank Dr. Berenchuk, who's been an excellent mentor and very supportive throughout all of this. And hopefully I'll see you guys uh, at the next uh, conference if we were able to have one next year. Excellent. So uh, uh, after showing these, I will uh, uh, kindly uh, ask Professor Antonio Baez de Luna to, to present his lecture. Uh, and he will he will give the the, the history of the bias <laughs> syndrome until the consensus, and so please, uh, Antonio, go on. It's a big pleasure to have you here. It's uh, an opportunity to learn with you and to to to, to be together again. Okay, many thanks, Tom, for your presentation and for your organization. This is for me a great pleasure to participate in this meeting with my friend Adrian Baranchuk and on the organization of the International Society of Pathology presided by you. All our thanks to all the organizers. And now I will try to speak in 20, 25 minutes, the first part of this conference that will deal especially with the diagnosis and the clinical implications of advanced identity of work uh, uh, that I, I will be shown later on by the uh, Okay, uh, uh, the problem is that to, to speak about the P-Wave is not so easy because the P-Wave was sweeping like uh, Cinderella, as you can see in this drawing of my sister Pivarin in the upper part of the, this uh, slide. And then suddenly arrive an arrow like a P plus minus and wake her up and make he and make she that it starts to be a princess. So this is what will has happened with the P wave. He came from a Cinderella to princess just because appear the advanced identity of rock. In fact, in the only book that has been published on P-Wave uh, arterial electrocardiogram, there is not any mention, as you can see in the index that is here, that the arterial, arterial blocks exist. So this was a, a part of, of cardiology that was completely forbidden. This one. However, in the 1978, uh, the Netherlands government and celebrate the commemoration of the discovery of the ECG by Eindhoven with a stamp. And in, in the front of Eindhoven, in this stamp, you can see a beautiful pre plus minus uh, that represents the advanced identity of block. I don't know what happened that, because at this moment nobody knows that this type of block exists, but this is the, the history and this is the truth. Isn't it? Right? However, we know now that there is, without doubt, uh, the uh, arterial blocks, as the other types of heart blocks, may be of first degree or partial, third degree, advanced, or second degree, or intermittent. And what is sure is that these ECC patterns are due to the presence of block. And this is true because they may, may appear transiently they may appear in the absence of vascular enlargement and ischemic heart disease, and they may be reproduced experimentally. And we will demonstrate now all that in a, in a, in a, few, in a few seconds. Right. Already in the 70s, Albert Waldo performed uh, this experimental study in dogs that cutting the backbone bundle at the right and left side of the heart induce the presence of the typical pattern of uh, advanced identity of work with the plus minus morphology in both sides of the area. And just a few months ago, next slide, uh, in our laboratory, uh, Pepe Guerra demonstrated with a very original uh, uh, demonstration that uh, putting ice in a, a rope with the finger pushing the, the open chest in the zone of Bachmann bundle, they may be in the first moment the uh, wineness of the P wave, then the presence, so this means 
partial intraatrial block, then the presence of plus minus morphology are increasing the duration. And when this happens, stop to push to to pressure the, with the eyes the backman of the of the of the peak and disappear the pattern. So this is a transient appearance of different types of intraatrial block experimentally. Mm. However, the, the first uh, tracing published uh, that represent uh, uh, an example of partial intraatrial block was published by Bachmann, the same of discover of the of the bundle. In this slide, you can see the increase of duration of the P wave in this patient that he considered was due to the presence of the uh, delaying in conduction in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the bundle, and this was demonstrated in the the index is right. You you will see the presence of very important arterial fibrosis that is good. Now has been demonstrated that is present in all the cases of important arterial block. A 15 years later was published with excellent monography on atrial uh, disease and by Paul Pouet from Montpellier, a great professor of cardiology from France. And in this uh, was the first type that I know was published uh, uh, an ECG with the presence of P plus minus in 2, 3 and PF, as you can see. And this was due to the uh, demonstration by Paul Pouet that with uh, the high esophageal weight was demonstrated that this part of the P wave that was negative in 2, 3 and PF corresponds with the with the part of the ECG uh, taken in the high esophageal weight. This is right, please. Afterwards, all, so, some of the uh, many, 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 many uh, researchers from, from Europe and the, and the States published different, different papers or short, short series of cases of advanced intraatrial block. Between, uh, between these cases was our group that published in the Spanish Journal of Cardiology, as you will see here with the 28 cases. Afterwards, in 85, we published an important paper in which we demonstrate the presence of advanced intellectual work, and we uh, define the ECG criteria and vectorcardiographic uh, criteria and orthogonal criteria of this type of uh, advanced intellectual work, as we will see in the next slide. Here, <coughs> you, you see in the upper part of the slide, how it's possible to recognize the activation of the, of the right and left atria that gives this type of P loop and uh, this P wave. When there is a decrease of conduction in the urban bundle, there is no problem because the conduction is going through this, this bundle of but with it, delay and this represents the uh, longer uh, P wave loop and a longer P wave uh, ECG. But when uh, there is completely block the uh, uh, bundle and the stimulus cannot go to the, the left atrium through the inter atrial septum because it is of connective tissue then the activation of the vefatium has to be performed retrogradally, as you can see here in this slide, retrogradally, and this represents the presence of the retrograde activation of the vefatium that is going upwards uh, in the zone of uh, a negative hemifield of VF, and this represents the presence of P plus minus in 2, 3 and BF. This is a typical example of this type of block that uh, is a, a, a typical case because you will see the typical cases. But always considering that the key point for diagnosis is the presence of negative P wave in the last part of the BF read, because this represents that the last part of the 
PYF of, 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 of the PYF MPF represents that there is a retrograde activation of the wave atrium because the negative emi field of BF starts at zero degrees. This is an example of typical open chest, uh, open uh, group in case of advanced initiative work, as you can see here. And in other cases, this is right, there is the same uh, upper part retrograde activation of the atrium, but all the, the P group is very close. Much probably these two types of loop may represent different types of presence of atrial fibrosis in the atria. Now this uh, may, may be proof with correlation with magnetic resonance, but uh, uh, I am sure that some of you can do that, this study. I cannot do that because I cannot perform a vectocardiogram just now at this moment. Next one, please. And this is what we have said before. We demonstrated that with the high esophageal width, this is the last part of the P wave that is activated and is activated retrogradually. And this is a study of Paco Garcia Cosio, that it is the, the endocardial mapping of the, of the activation of the atria in case of advanced initiative work. And now let's go to speak um, a moment about the second degree interactive block. This uh, second degree interactive block has other types of uh, blocks at uh, different types of level. Maybe present, as you can see in the next slide. In this case, in this patient, there is a white P wave, but in 2, 3, and BF, but not by, by model, but not by FASIC. And after HSS testing, you can see that transiently appear clearly the P, the P plus minus of advanced initiative block. So this was a technically connect, connected uh, uh, advanced initiative block. In all occasions, next slide, we can see that there exists a very clear P plus minus in V2, and after a, a PVC, there is a long pause and uh, disappear the P plus minus, and then later on appear again. So this was related, radically related to the presence of advanced in the ideal block, second degree. And uh, we just uh, published a few years ago the existence of atypical patterns of advanced in the ideal block uh, that you will see just now in the next one. Remember what we have said. To be sure that there is a Bunsen initiative block, we need to assure that exists the presence of a P negative P wave in the vast part of the P wave in BF, because this represents, because the, the negative emi field of BF starts at zero degrees, and this represents that the vast part of P wave is above zero degrees. So the typical cases always may be diagnosed only if exists this negative part of P wave in with BF. And there is uh, also uh, some cases or atypical cases due to duration. When the P wave uh, lasts less than 120 milliseconds, you will see that. These are the three types. I will explain to you next one. This is a typical type one. Let's go to see the P loop. In this case, you, you see that this is zero degrees, and this is uh, minus 30 degrees. The P starts being positive, and then became isoelectric because falls in the limit of positive and negative emi field of lead two, that lead two is here. So the, the zero degrees for V2 is here. So if the rate of activation is around minus 30 degrees, the, in the ECG we will see is electric line. And this is what we can see here in this slide, in this part of the slide. Let's go to see the, the morphology type two 
uh, typical. In this case, the, uh, the, the last part of the P wave may be negative positive, as we can see here in the, with the high amplitude, positive negative, and in PF it is negative plus minus. And you, as you can see here, obviously, all the last part of the P wave falls above zero degrees. This means that it's, it's negative in BF, but look that if it falls beyond minus 30 degrees, this first negative in V2, that the, the, the hemifield positive was still here, but finally it may fall in the positive part of the positive hemifield of V2, between minus 30 degrees and zero degrees. And this represents the presence of the P minus minus plus in V2 in this type of morphology. The next one is when the P loop starts above or around zero degrees. And this means that in with PF may be isoelectric and then it's all negative. And as well, it's also negative in V2, and in V3 may look like a junction of rhythm. And in order to distinguish this type of uh, advanced integral block, a typical by morphology from advanced integral from junction of rhythm, we have to go, next one is right, to read B5 and B6. In the case of uh, junction of rhythm, you will see that in with B5 and B6 will be negative as happened with junctional rhythm. In the case of uh, the type 3 advanced uh, atypical morphology, uh, the, the, in B5 and B6, the P wave will be positive. So this is very important. And we published that with Adriana and Patanov a few, to, a few years ago in a uh, journal of electrocardiology. Next slide, please. So these are uh, all the loops that we, we can see. These first two loops are in case of normal, normal cases. The loop is like that with counterclockwise rotation. And in this case, in P, in, in V3, the P wave may be a positive negative because uh, finish before zero degrees, but it is obviously positive in two and BF. This is the case of typical advanced integrative block with typical pattern, as you can see here. And these are the three types of a typical morphology P wave that we have explained to you before. Next is right. In a few cases, we have seen a, a, a short number of cases, but they exist. There is less fibrosis in the, in the atria and the conduction in the atria is normal, except in the part of the atria that is the stimulus interrupted. In this case, by a great repopper that we are submitted with the Vicia from Spain at the end to the journal now. And in this case, as you can see here, the great repopper, the conduction of the stimulus is normal. And for that, the duration of the stimulus may be less than 120, but the, the morphology of the P wave is typically plus minus, as you can see in this slide. Next one. However, in the majority of the elderly people that progressively became the, uh, uh, the atrial block advanced, as happened in this case, that we published in the other page a few years ago, with the correlation with magnetic resonance, we are seeing that the presence of fibrosis is very important. And this explains the existence of this type of P plus minus in 2 CMBF with a duration that's superior to 120. And uh, Adrian Balanchuk explained to you that the presence of atrial fibrosis is a key point to explain the association of uh, advancing in the atrial work with dementia and, and, and also with uh, a stroke. Next slide, right, please. This is just a summary of what we have been explaining to you now. Next slide. Right. And very recently, we have submitted a paper that demonstrates 
that uh, the cases of uh, the typical cases have the same critical significance as the typical ones. Therefore, uh, we consider that the, the, the presence of uh, atypical cases of advanced, of advanced identity of work represents the, the same danger of ictus and uh, dementia that the, uh, now we are, we are studying this possibility. Next slide, please. And finally, the clinical implications of uh, the advanced identity of work. This is what will be explained by uh, Adrian Branchuk uh, by a syndrome atrial fibrillation of flutter, uh, stroke, dementia, or death. Just to say that we published in, already in 88 this paper in the European Health Journal, in which you can see, this is right, that cases with advanced identity of work present much higher incidence of atrial fatal of fibrillation in patients than the control group that already was formed by, by patients with, by patients with uh, partial intellectual work. Since then, since then in 1888 till 2012, especially three groups, the Spodic, the Patronov, and the Garcia Cosio, and ourselves, uh, was devoted to this uh, type of studies. This is right. I want to give a tribute to David Spodic that passed away very recently and was one of the pioneers, as we will see you later on, of this type of the studies. This one. And just to say that already we know that this was a syndrome, as we are saying in this paper in another page. Next one. And also Jim Brando in the pro, in the follow-up of our book, next one, and other doctors also say the same, next one. But till the uh, consensus paper of 2012 was not a clear demonstration that this was important part of the uh, electrocardiography, and this was published in the Journal of Electrocardiology in 2012. And at this moment, next one, appear a figure of the Ambaranchuk that was really uh, in love with this problem and he coined the concept of atrial fibrillation and of, uh, of uh, Bayer syndrome and wrote a lot of books and uh, papers about that that we he will explain just now after my presentation. This is right. So this was represented just here with the, this is the case by the case the number of papers related with this topic. And in the last eight years, there's a huge number of papers. And this is what we will explain by you, we will explain to you by Dr. Adrian Balenciu. Thank you, Adrian, for your support. You do all the time. And thank you all of you for attending my presentation. Thank you very much. We would like to thank you, Professor uh, Antonio Baez de Luna, for this, this presentation and for your lifetime contribution to electrocardiography. Uh, it's a big pleasure to have you here. I, I would like to say that uh, if you have questions or we have a brief discussion by, by the end, uh, you can uh, use the chat uh, box uh, below you, below the presentation, to, to write something for us. And now it's a pleasure to have uh, Adrian, Adrian Barnschuk, that's it's professor of medicine at Queen's University in, in, in Canada. And uh, it's past president of the International Society of Electrocardiology and also the vice president of ISHNI, the Sister Society. Uh, please, uh, Adrian, go on. It's, it's... Thank you very much, Tom. <clears throat> uh, I would like to, to thank the International Society of Electrocardiology for inviting us uh, with Professor Valles to deliver these two presentations. Um, I I want to specifically thank uh, uh, Professor Tom Ribeiro, Professor Rob McLeod for an amazing work in setting up this uh, all together in a record time and, and to use this presentation as a start kick for what is aimed to be a monthly webinar where we can all sit and discuss uh, interesting topics on electrocardiology. And I want to thank the International Society of Electrocardiology Young Community for your commitment to keep the ECG alive. This group is coordinated by Dr. Goxel Sr. from Turkey 
and we have several members today. They are uh, working very actively and publishing papers on different domains. So thanks all of you and thank you for being here today. Um, I want to be sure that my slides uh, move correctly. So I have no conflict uh, of interest to present this talk. And the big challenge is to talk after uh, Professor Baez de Luna because the way that he's able to conceptualize uh, a topic that, that he dedicated his life to uh, is, um, is quite challenging. So what I'm going to try to do is to show you what happened to this topic after the consensus published in the Journal of Electrocardiology in 2012. Uh, and it's a tremendous pleasure for me to be able to share uh, this space with him. Uh, and uh, this is something that I'm very proud and I will be able to show to my grandkids, which is I wrote a book with uh, Dr. Baez de Luna. So I'm very, very happy with this opportunity. And as Antonio said, uh, this large group of colleagues uh, have um, uh, put this document together where intra blocks definitely got a proper definition and a separation to uh, left atrial enlargement that for many ages was considered to be the same. Now we know that intra block is specifically a dramatropic phenomenon is a conduction disease, which of course can occur along with enlargement of the left atrial chamber, but it's not limited to. And in that consensus, they classified either in partial or advanced, uh, depending on, on having or not the typical morphology, uh, which is a classification that I do embrace and prefer over the first, second and third degree, which was uh, advanced by um, Professor Valles de Luna as an analogy to what happens in the AV node. And in this uh, document that I recommend you to read, it's everything you need to know about the inter block and specifically Bayes syndrome. So um, the, the idea of coming with an eponym to identify an anatomical and functional substrate uh, um, named the intra block with the uh, frequent association with supraventricular arrhythmias and more specifically atrial fibrillation um, took us to uh, the idea that this could be recognized in the person that has described uh, absolutely every corner of this disease. And this is how we came up with the idea of the Bayes syndrome. And the original paper was published seven years ago in the archives of Mexican cardiology not, not as, a, um, as a random publication, but rather to recognize a long-term friendship between uh, Bayes de Luna that you can see here very young and uh, Dr. Ignacio Chavez from Mexico, one of the South American um, uh, most recognized uh, ECG masters. And in that paper, we also been able to squeeze a picture of Bayes and family and his handwriting approach, which is the sort of landmark uh, um, of his activities. So since then, the, the eponym grew up, not only, uh, uh, not only as a consequence of the research uh, done by, by the groups that advanced the eponym, but it was embraced by the community. So there are a few questions that still were working uh, uh, to answer. And <clears throat> uh, since the creation of the eponym and during the times of, um, of Bayes working on this topic, it was needed that other groups also were able to uh, individualize the conduction disorder and advance research towards uh, the link between uh, the intra block and cardiac arrhythmias. Um, the que second question, if this is a manifestation of left atrial enlargement only, I think was properly answered during the 2012 um, uh, consensus where several uh, entities were identified as presented with advanced intra block but with normal left atrium size. And the third question, which is what I'm going to spend the time today, is can intra block 
predict atrial fibrillation and stroke, dementia and death uh, in a specific populations? Do we need a registry for that? And do we need to consider early anticoagulation? So some of the questions will remain open as we are collecting more and more data. So this is part of the work of Dr. Spodek in the US. He took a slightly different definition for the, for the intra block. However, he also confirmed in a large number of patients that the presence of intra block was associated with atrial fibrillation. And more importantly, he advanced uh, maybe the first solid study showing that uh, uh, advanced intra block also is able to predict a stroke. So I want to show you some scenarios that I'm going to briefly mention today so I can leave at least seven, eight minutes for discussion. So I'm going to approach the post um, uh group of patients. And when, when I say clinical scenarios, clinical scenarios with advanced intraitral block or intraitral block in general is able to predict atrial fibrillation or recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So post cardioversion, advanced heart failure, post atrial flutter ablation, post pulmonary vein isolation ablation, in Chagas disease in the general population, after TAVI in patients with coronary artery disease, non-STEMI and STEMI, and patients with carotid disease in the elderly, in the post cabbage, in the sleep apnea group, and in patients with pacemakers. So let's start going through this. Uh, this was the first study. Now there are three or four uh, on identifying partial and advanced intraitral block as predictors of atrial fibrillation recurrence after pharmacological cardioversion. Of course, the P wave in this case is measured after the patient returns to sinus rhythm. And um, what we notice is that patients with advanced intraitral block have up to 65% risk of recurrence within the first year. In patients with advanced uh, heart failure, so our group used a population of patients with uh, CRTs, and what we did is we identified uh, for those patients that did not have atrial pacing, um, P wave duration, and the presence of advanced intraitrial block, and both of them were able to predict atrial fibrillation um, as measure in the storage capacity of their devices. And then the Spaniard group commanded by Anthony Baez Genis, who is nobody else than uh, Professor Baez de Luna's son and a very close friend of mine in a very large population demonstrated uh, that patients with advanced heart failure, not only advanced intraitral block predicted um, atrial fibrillation, but also stroke. So it was very significant for both entities. And this study uh, led by my colleague, Dr. Enrique West, now working in Canada, uh, show that in patients where we ablate uh, flatter in sinus rhythm, the presence of intraitral block predicts uh, atrial fibrillation 35 at first year, 65 at two years. And this is very important because some groups still consider it that anticoagulation after a flatter ablation is no longer needed. And what we introduced about six years ago is the concept that most of these patients may represent now no with flatter, but with atrial fibrillation. So considering long-term uh, anticoagulation is important. And um, this study led by uh, Jake, Jane Caldwell from now in Scotland, at that time in, in Canada in our lab, uh, showed that the same thing happens with the recurrence of atrial fibrillation after atrial fibrillation ablation. And this has changed a little bit the way that um, interventional EPs treat atrial fibrillation when the patient returns to the lab uh, uh, with a recurrence of atrial fibrillation. We call that a redo. Why is that? Because it seems that patients with prolonged wave duration and advanced intraitral block do have a different mechanism that increase automatism in the pulmonary veins. And how do we know that? Know that? Because there was no difference between the patients uh, that presented with recurrence with or without intraitral block in terms of reconnection of pulmonary veins. 
indicating that the physiopathological mechanism to produce atrial fibrillation is something else than automatism. And we do believe that is intraatrial dyssynchrony induced by intraatrial block. Uh, for the Latin Americans, this is quite important because patients with Chagas disease, and keep in mind that Chagas cardiomyopathy in the world, not in Latin America, is the most common cause of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with the whole spectrum of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is large populations only in the U.S. is estimated 300,000 people living with Chagas disease, only in the U.S. a non-endemic country due to migration. So patients with Chagas disease and cardiomyopathy um, do present with, frequently with stroke. And for ages, we thought that that had to do with an apical aneurysm. Uh, now we know that intraitral block is quite frequent in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy and Chagas disease, and that P-wave duration and advanced intraitral block can significantly predict atrial fibrillation and a stroke. So that has opened a new set of uh, investigations. And as I was saying before, it was important that other groups also take a look at this. And I am super pleased uh, to show this uh, a study from the ARIC group led by my friend El Sayed Solomon that showed that the incidence of advanced intraitral block in the general population, this is almost 15,000 patients, uh, was 2.2 2.27, but more interestingly, please pay attention to this, the, pre, the presence of intraitral block in the general population had three more time chances of presenting atrial fibrillation than patients without intraitral block. So, and again, uh, um, this uh, large group of colleagues uh, with uh, our friend, uh, Dr. Platanov in it, has also shown now 152,000 patients that advanced intraitral block and uh, intraitral block as a whole is a strong predictor of atrial fibrillation, has a ratio of 3.38 for ischemic stroke 1.45, uh, for all cause mortality 1.35. So as you can see, this has expanded beyond the initial group investigating these and everybody's leading in the same direction. This is the specific group of TAVI. This was led by Bryce Alexander, who was awarded today with the Bayes Award. Congratulations, Bryce. Uh, and again, um, in, in, in the post-TAVI group, the presence of injury block helps predicting atrial fibrillation. This patient also led by Bryce, um, published in American Journal a few years ago, uh, has been cited several times, and it is um, a large study showing that in patients with uh, um, non-STEMI but with advanced coronary artery disease, the presence of advanced intraitral block predicts atrial fibrillation and stroke. This study was led by Goxel Sr., the current coordinator of the ISC Young Community, and I think he's in the audience today, um, uh, uh, showing us the value of both partial and advanced intraitral block and uh, P wave duration to predict atrial fibrillation in patients presented with STEMI. Again, Bryce, in a large group of patients with coronary artery disease and carotid disease, the, pay, the presence of partial or advanced intraitral block in multiple uh, um, um, in multivariate analysis, sorry, predicts uh, the presence of atrial fibrillation. This has been led by my friend Martinez Sayez, one of uh, uh, Bayes' disciples, showing uh, that intraitral block predicts atrial fibrillation in very old patients. And of course, in patients going under cabbage, our group failed to demonstrate this. And we, we think that <clears throat> maybe the, the acute triggers that occur during surgery play a major role rather than the anatomical substrate. In advance, uh, advanced intraitral block predicts uh, uh, atrial fibrillation in patients with OSA and CPAP clearly reduce the anatomical substrate by reducing the size of the P wave. 
this was done in Spain in patients with intracardiac devices. The, pay, the presence of intrauteral block predicts high rate, atrial heart rate episodes, which is a good surrogate for atrial fibrillation. And again, Goxel leading this study that shows that the presence of intrauteral block predicted silent ischemic brain lesions. And Garit Tse, again from the ISC Young community, did this wonderful meta-analysis cited several times in the last three years, showing in many different situations, advanced intrauteral block predicting atrial fibrillation recurrence. And then we end up with this registry that it was uh, the it, it was started a few years ago and interrupted early, where we put a group of patients older than 70 with a structural heart disease and no clinical atrial fibrillation uh, uh, in follow-up, and we divide them into three groups: normal, partial, and advanced intrauteral block. Uh, the results were published a few months ago in Europace. Uh, we interrupted the study because with 556 patients completing the follow-up, advanced intrauteral block predicted atrial fibrillation, stroke, and the combination of AF and stroke. And that is leading us to several questions, which is, for example, in this case, this recently published few weeks ago, all partial, advanced, and all intrauteral block predict uh, uh, dementia and, um, and cognitive impairment. So it is quite clear that that is slowly uh, leading us to the need of consider, at least consider uh, some group of patients to have to be anticoagulated even when you have not demonstrated atrial fibrillation. And for that, Manuel martinez Sayes and, and his group is working actively in advancing the first randomized control trial for patients with advanced intrauteral block and no history of atrial fibrillation. And it's very, uh, I'm very proud that, that this topic uh, uh, end up in circulation and you know how difficult that is. So full recognition to the eponym and now it's uh, widely used. And the last uh, that I'm going to show you to move to questions is that advanced intrauteral block and intrauteral dyssynchrony became part of what we now call atrial failure. We are all familiarized with what ventricular failure is. So it's pretty obvious to us that the same syndrome can be described for the atrium. And we define it as any atrial dysfunction, anatomical, mechanical, electrical, or rheological, including blood hemostasis. Uh, causing impaired heart performance and symptoms and worsening your quality of life or your life expectancy in the absence of obviously of valvular or ventricular abnormality. And this group had the pleasure of working with two young fellows that are just starting their careers, but I think that they are promising a lot. I refer to the one and only Professor Baez de Luna and the one and only Professor Eugene Brownwald who have supported this research and I will invite you is open access. So you can read it from Jack early in 2020. Uh, and more importantly, understanding the difference of the physiopathology as Professor Baez de Luna was explaining the advanced fibrotic uh, left atrium versus the symptoms and the clinical manifestations of the disease. So uh, I'm very pleased uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to show you the book that we put together that counted with a foreword from Eugene Brangwell who said this book will surely stimulate interest in what has been a largely neglected corner of cardiology as a consequence of the outstanding work of Bayes, Baranchak and collaborators have contributed to this book, Intraitra Block is no longer a stepchild. And I'm very happy to um, stop here to give time for some questions and to thank again ISE authorities in the name of Professor McLeod and Professor Rivero. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Adrian, for uh, this brilliant presentation. And uh, we have one, one question from the, from the audience. And I, I will begin with Goxo uh, Sidier that uh, asked that, uh, uh, according to your experience, do you think a typical AIAB predisposed patients to elevated risk of atrial fibrillation and stroke? We want to know which other patients 
with uh, 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 advanced initiative work that may present negative innovation? This is the question. Uh, I think the question is if atypical, atypical intraatrial blocks can predict atrial fibrillation and stroke. Yes. yes. Uh, I, I have said very quickly in my presentation that seems that have the same importance than typical ones uh, because they have also longer duration and they have also, by sure, the total activation of the vibratium. So we are now checking uh, all the all our, our last papers to demonstrate if the impression that we have taken with the with the the, the, the uh, studies that we have checked till now is that the typical and atypical pattern have the same importance in order to recognize the uh, relationship between um, a, a in theater of work and anti-fibrillation and stroke. And this is what seems that represents, and we are now studying uh, that, the bias resistor. So this means that the, 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 we have to remember that the importance of the association with the stroke and with uh, uh, fibrillation is also the duration of the P-wave. If the, the patients of a typical pattern, uh, the majority of them have a duration of the P-wave greater than 120. So I, 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 I will consider now, obviously, obviously, uh, Tom, this means that there are patients, elderly patients, and with some type of uh, heart disease. This is the, the, the group of patients that we are studying. So this means a shut mask of at least two or three. Eh? Uh, uh, patients with more than 65 years old. This is the group of patients that we are studying. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I will I have, I have a, it's not it's a question itself, but something that uh, asking, uh, I'm going to say a little, do we have a lot of uh, young uh, physicians inside the room? And there is the old concept of left atrial enlargement. There is the, the interatrial block, the, the bias syndrome. And now uh, some, some reports of atrial myopathy and atrial failure. Uh, and uh, I, would, I think it would be very, very important to have to, to the attendants to, to understand uh, that uh, what are the the common aspects of these in what is specific and please Adrian can you help us with with this sure thanks for the question so so basically uh, and and for the people that follows me in in, in in social media you know that I am quite avocant to try to establish proper terminology for different ECG phenomena and uh, what happens is that a beautiful super uh, um, romantic name was advanced decades ago called p mitrali people is in love with the concept of p mitrali because it sounds beautiful but it is incorrect p mitrali was described because obviously when you have mitral stenosis which was super common in the past and now is way less common the left atrium enlarges and then you have a longer p wave duration with a classic partial interatrial block morphology or notched p wave and some of the work of uh, Professor Bias was to reverse that terminology to show people the evidence that advanced intraatrial block can occur with, in patients with absolutely normal left atrium sizes. So this is not a manifestation of left atrial enlargement, but rather a purely dramatropic uh, condition. That means it is the connectivity between the right and the left atrium what is damaged. Of course, as it happens with left bundle branch block in the ventricle, if you dilate the ventricle, then you stretch the conduction system and then you see the, the, the alteration in, in conductivity. However, you can have left bundle branch block in patients with hypertension and normal volumes or with no hypertension and just as a manifestation of aging and, and, and deterioration of the conduction system. So this applies also for the intraatrial block. Intraatrial block is a dramatropic phenomenon. It's a conduction disease that can be present in patients with or without left atrial enlargement. 
Yes, I, I agree absolutely with what has been said by Adrian. And in fact, in our paper of uh, year 88, we publish uh, the study of uh, the incidence of advanced theater work in a series of 80,000 patients that we have been uh, studied during five years. And in 10%, at least in 10% of cases, the, the, all these patients had uh, echocardiography. And at least in 10%, there is not web even margin. So uh, as he said, this is a, 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 a problem exactly what happened with web and the rest of And our, perhaps I want to say merit, is to, to have realized that we have to apply to the area what has been already done in the ventricle. And this is, by sure, uh, evident, evidently true, my opinion. Excellent. It was very important for us. Uh, I have several questions. I, I will try to summarize some of them uh, because our time is, is running. And, but first, it's uh, about uh, automatic measures of P waves and uh, intraatrial blocks and bias syndrome. Uh, are there any, Gary, to say, are there any concerns then that automatic ECG measurements are less accurate than those made manually and uh, as a second question, the same range, should we screen the general population using any method for uh, intraatrial blocks or sub bias syndrome, in, considering that it's a risk factor for AFib and stroke? And so automatic measures would be extremely useful in this way. Please, uh, you yeah, both. I, I will say, uh, we, we start to, to measure the, the P wave with calipers. And uh, uh, when we start to, to work with, uh, uh, with Alberto Escobar from Colombia that came to, to be a fellow of, of, of mine in, in Barcelona, he introduced us the GeoGebra method. And we discussed with our statistics and we realized that the GeoGebra method, that I really, I am not doing that, but I, I know that it's probably the best method to measure that. But with calipers may be enough. So the, the use of wood calipers may be enough. But, and in, in this sense, uh, the, the decision to have the 120 as a measure of uh, the uh, separation between uh, arterial work and normal was in part because the people may make these, these measurement uh, with uh, just a, uh, a, a quick look at the ECG because there are three uh, small squares in the ECG that each one measure 40 milliseconds. So if there is at least three of this uh, distance, this measure 120. But the, the method that we are using in, in our paper uh, is all calipers or who can have the method. Okay. And, and Adrian, maybe you can, you can answer the second part of the question. It's specifically yeah. given the high prevalence of IAB mm -hmm. in general population, especially the elder, and its relation with a AF stroke and dementia. Can we promote the detection of AIB among the primary care physicians? So um, thanks, Gary, for, for the question. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, in, for, for the first part of the, the question... From, from Jesus, Jesus Alvarez. Jesus Alvarez did this. Oh, Jesus. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Here you go. Yes. Uh, so thank you both. Then. Uh, so for the first part of the question, uh, I, I had several meetings with industry trying to advance different um, um, algorithms to measure P-wave onset and offset. It's completely doable. A uh, few years ago, there was no interest because they thought that this would not call the attention of the users. So this is something that uh, younger individuals need to uh, re-attack. It is doable. It is doable with the same limitations that any other automatic measurement. As a, as a, as a personal physician, I, I pay very little attention because I prefer when I need to measure to measure myself. But of course, that in the global scale of things, having uh, uh, integrated the automatic P-wave duration, I think that it could be 
uh, is something quite interesting. And to be honest, doing um, a simple algorithm to detect advanced intra block as, as they can report on left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block, it could be super easy. So I see no limitations from that angle. But going more interestingly to the second part of the question, um, my tendency is that outside the research arena is to leave asymptomatic general population alone. So basically I don't stop people in the street and say, hey, you look quite healthy, but by the way, uh, can I do an angiogram and figure out if you have coronary artery disease or can do an ECG to see if I can find intra block? So one thing is what we need to know as epidemiologists. And the other thing is transforming this into uh, systematic screening. Because even when the ECG costs one buck or $2 or, or it's quite cheap, when you multiply this into the million people that, that are living in the planet, that are not having any disease, uh, uh, suggesting that we should screen them with, with an ECG looking for those that are sick. Uh, it's something that is at least uh, disputable. So um, my sense is to be quite cautious to transform epidemiological relevant data that help us constructing syndromes and ideas into clinical practice. So in, uh, then we go to the last questions, both by Gotzel. Uh, considering these, what everything you said, in your routine practice, how do you manage when you see a patient with advanced or partial interatrial block? Do you just screen them more frequently or consider anticoagulation uh, in some cases? Okay. I will say my, my opinion. Uh, uh, the idea would be that we perform a trial and uh, compare patients with uh, advanced intellectual work uh, with patients without advanced intellectual work of the same characteristics uh, in a randomized clinical trial, giving, uh, or, or giving uh, an, an evaluation in, in one group and and normal in the other room. But uh, we are trying to perform this study. We are not having the success to have uh, uh, sponsors for this study. But for that, we, we cannot give a global uh, advice to the people. To give the global advice to the people and say, if you are 75 years old, you have health, ischemic health disease, and you have a bachelor in the end of work without evidence of antifibrillation, you have to be anticoagulated. This is global advice we are not able to, to give to the people now. But we can give individual advice if we consider that the patient deserves anticoagulation because in spite uh, after that, he has premature ventricular contractions or he has a chance of four or five that much probably already needs Antifibrillation and needs anticoagulation without the evidence of antifibrillation. What we want to say is that for us, the presence of advanced injective work in elderly people represents the same danger practically to have a stroke and dementia that to, to present antifibrillation. But we are not able to give uh, this uh, as a global advice to the people without we have, we have not to perform the, the randomized clinical trial and demonstrate that. This is my opinion, but at the end, sometimes uh, have an opinion or are not so, so uh, happy with the individualized approach of the problem. What do you think, Adriano? Well, that? I think Ad Adrian will agree with you, but I ask him also to. to to answer the last question is that if an uh, intraatrial block can be reversed, so go okay. on, Adrian, and, and, and so, go your, your finish. It doesn't matter. If Very you, good. So, so um, in, in this, in this um, long-term relationship with Dr. Baez de Luna, uh, I, he has to score so many goals, and I only scored one, which wants to convince him to wait for a randomized control trial between a NOAC versus aspirin 
before indicating anticoagulation to people with no demonstrated atrial fibrillation. At the present time, there, are, there is one study which is called Arcadia that is using the echocardiogram to see left atrial volumes to randomize patients apixaban versus aspirin. So the Amiable study, which is Antonio's idea working with Martinez AS is going to be randomizing ENOAC versus aspirin based on the data of the Bayes registry. If we demonstrate that full anticoagulation is better than aspirin for these people to prevent stroke, then we will have a very solid indication. In the meantime, in the meantime, this remains as a hypothesis, but the hypothesis is not empty of content. If you have a patient with any of the conditions that I mentioned today, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, whatever, with advanced intraatrial block, what you have to do is aggressive and intensive extended cardiac monitoring looking for atrial fibrillation. And that can be done with halters, with event monitors, with a smartwatch, with a Fitbit, with a cardio device, whatever you like to use, whatever you have available, use it. But you have to look for atrial fibrillation and you will be surprised that not less than six or seven in 10 patients that you find with this condition, you demonstrate atrial fibrillation and then you can proceed to the next step, which is anticoagulation. So that was my one gold score in this in this game. <laughs> and to finalize my my speech uh, and thanking you again uh, and dear friends like Professor McFarlane, Professor Nikos that have been there, Palm, uh, all friends from the ISC. Uh, I could say to the answer of can be reversed. The answer is yes. So part of the anatomical substrate, if you put um, if, if you implement the proper treatment for those, the anatomical substrate can, uh, can improve. We proved it in two populations. One is the heart failure population undergoing optimized medical treatment and cardiac resynchronization therapy, where the size, the uh, structural dimension of the left atrium improves and the P wave shortens. A different story is if that is enough to remove atrial fibrillation from the picture. The second group, I show it today very quickly because it was a long presentation, is in patients with sleep apnea. We used uh, um, signal average P wave analysis and we show that after four to six weeks of 100% adherence to CPAP, the P wave shrinks significantly. So the question should be, oh, great. So I don't need anticoagulation then because there's not going to be atrial fibrillation and atrial fibrillation disappears from the picture. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Why? Because what is dead, it is dead. And that can remain as the anatomical substrate. And this is why, despite improving the dynamic of the atrium, improving the atrial failure uh, syndrome, we may not reduce to zero atrial fibrillation because what what has been damaged definitely, we cannot improve. The, the improvement of the rest of the atrium is the area that is suffering, for example, ischemia, uh, uh, high, high, pressure, high intracavitary pressure due to heart failure, or the aggression of intermittent hypoxia. When we improve all that, the cells that have not died can be recruited and the dynamics of the atrium improve but unfortunately it may not be enough to remove completely atrial fibrillation from the picture. Okay, uh, I would like to thank a lot first uh, Professor Adrian and Professor Antonio Baez de Luna uh, for their, their excellent presentations, but also for being so active in, in our society and to, to try to, to have young persons working together and to have everything working well. I, I would like to thank a lot uh, Rob McLeod as an excellent partner in doing things uh, and for hosting this, this, this meeting. I understand that it was very, it was very interesting, very well succeed, and we will uh, continue to do uh, this monthly webinar from the beginning of the year on. Uh, this one will be available in YouTube in the next year in a specific channel so we can uh, other persons will be able to to, to learn from, from from you there, and 
out of this said thank you everyone thank you for the the international board members that are here peter uh, kiel uh Bilen and, and all and also uh we wish you uh, happy holidays uh, merry christmas for, for those happy happy new year and that 2021 that it, it could be better and we will that we can live safer and better than we did this year so uh, thank you all yeah. Rob, it's up, up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank for... you, Antonio. Bye bye. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thanks, much. Rob. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Bye, bye, Milan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for participating in the first of these ISE webinars, seminars held by world experts in electrocardiology, as you've seen today. We encourage you to visit our website, electrocardiology.org, and learn more about the next seminars in our series. Bye for now.